So we have an important announcement. Somebody lost their phone. I don't know whose it is, but it's an iPhone. It's yours. Okay, how do I know that it's yours? Who do you watch on YouTube? Yeah, that's it. Good job. Right on. Okay. Oh. Are we starting? <laughs> Sweet. Apparently we're starting. So uh, it's good to see all you big boys out there. When I say that I'm referring to everybody. I'm just kidding. Kind of. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to worship the Lord. I'm kind of tired. Are y'all tired? I got hit. I got hit in the face so many times by daggum flower sack thingies. I don't even know what that was. It was like the little pantyhose thingy. Is that what it was? Is that what it was? Okay, that's what it was. I still, I still feel like there are, are those all over my back. Like I've got, I've got a few little, yeah, that thingies. Did you say whelp or welt? Whelp. Whelp. Do y'all say whelp whelp? or whelp? whelp. I'm hearing mixed emotions. Just so y'all know, it's whelp with a, with a big boy P on the end. <laughs> All right. So, uh, anyways, so y'all stand with me. Let's worship the Lord together. We're going to sing Lion and the Lamb. One.
song uh, we've sung it a hundred times uh, how great is our God the bridge part though really just gets me every time name above all names worthy of all praise my heart will sing how great is our God Jesus is the name above all names Philippians 2 said that, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord whether um, whether those people confess their sin before Jesus and are pure before him on that day or not, though everyone will bow. So let's let's sing the greatness of our God. Let's sing this all together. You ready? How great. The splendor of a king and clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice. too high it trembles at his voice it trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God to age.
This is the first time this week that we're doing this song. Uh, it's an awesome song. Join me as we worship.
Romans 8 says that we're um, children, we're adopted as sons, we're no longer in our bondage of fear, slavery to fear, God. Uh, Lord, I pray for these, these students here and even these adults, some, some adults, Lord, I know I struggle with this still, God, I'm wanting to fall back into bondage of, of fear, Lord. Um, I pray that you'll please help us remember our identity in you, Jesus, that we are children, those of us who have professed you and put our faith in you, God, um, we are children of God, heirs of God, and um, children, Lord, I pray that we'll just remember that, that we are children of the Most High God, the name above all names, Lord. I pray that you'll speak to us through through the word that's about to be preached in mind, God. Thank you for, for all you do for us, God. Thank you so much for Jesus. Oh, thank you so much for, for coming and and being the perfect sacrifice for us, Lord, while we were still sinners. I just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you excited to be back in the house of the Lord? Yes. Are you having a good week? Yes. yes, maybe. Someone said sometimes. Look at all of you. You guys look really nice. Everybody feeling nice? How has camp been for you so far? I've had the time of my life. Uh, being with you guys this week, I've really enjoyed the services. Pardon me, I'm looking up a scripture verse here real quick. So, um, God is so good, and He never ceases to amaze me. And I believe that you know we're just halfway through, and this is now our third service of four, and uh, well, the evening services anyway. And I believe it's just going to get better and better. It gets progressively better, and I think part of that is because your expectation gets greater with each service. And so hopefully you've come tonight with uh, great expectancy uh, because I told a few of you yesterday uh, evening, um, maybe individually, or I may have even said it during the message that God will meet you at the point of your expectation and then blow it out of the water because he is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ever ask or imagine. Uh, one version says even he can do even greater things than we can come up with in our wildest dreams. And so I want to encourage you to have wild dreams. I want to encourage you to have great expectations. I believe that God puts certain desires in our hearts for a reason. And, you know, the plan that God has for your life is greater than you can accomplish in your own strength. It's greater than you can accomplish on your own. Uh, I know some of you are very talented and some of you are very gifted in certain areas and you can do a lot of different things with your life. Uh, but what God has called you to do is so much greater than you could ever do on your own. And that's why Paul said that we have to walk by faith and not by sight. We have to walk by faith and not by sight because or really how we feel or what we can see or what we hear or what we can touch. It goes so much, so far beyond our senses that's why we have to walk by faith because sometimes the will of God for our lives and what he has called us to do is so much greater than anything that we could come up with. We don't even understand it sometimes and we need faith to be able to walk it out. We need his strength to be able to do what he has called us to do. If what you're trying to do you can accomplish in your own strength then it's probably not God's plan for your life. What he's called you to do is going to require more and more of him. And so I just want to encourage you. Get your expectation up for tonight and as we go into tomorrow and even Friday morning before we send you guys out of here. I want you just to expect more. Uh, believe God for more. Because uh, we've had a great time the first two nights, but we've only begun to scratch the surface of how awesome God is. We've only begun to scratch the surface. Uh, it would take a lifetime. It would take... Uh, a million lifetimes 
I can't even come up with a number uh, that would be accurate enough to describe how long it would take for us to even begin to scratch the surface of how awesome God is. And so I just want to encourage you, up your expectation, all right? Ask God to increase your faith tonight and tomorrow and into the next week, all right? Can you guys do that for me? All right, now I told you I was going to give you some free stuff. I got three more books here, all right? And these are a little, you know, they're not intimidating at all, all right? Little things here. I love these. I wrote these so that you could just stick them and put them in your back pocket. And I'm, I'm doing a real bad job of putting it in there right now as a demonstration. But it really goes, all right? And uh, so Jack's going to come help me here. He's right at the front, whether you want to or not. If you give this to a girl, I'm going to really wonder about you. Actually, I won't. That'd be all right. You can give it to whoever you want. Uh, this is called The Love Habit. It's set up as a 31-day devotional. So, I mean, if you want, you can read it all the way through, but it's set, set up in such a way, you know, they say it takes 21 days to make a new habit, a good habit. It takes, like, no effort at all to start a bad habit. But to start a good habit, they say it takes 21 days. So I'm giving you 31 days. So you have 10 extra days to start a good habit of walking in love. And I love how all the boys are throwing their hands up. They need, they need help with walking in love. <laughs> So, Jack, you, don't, you have no shortage of people that want that book. Here he comes. Don't give it to the same person you did last night. Don't be influenced. I don't even know what he's doing. All right. He's taking way too long. All right. These other ones are set up the same way. 31 day. To, who'd you give it to? At, I'm, I'm raising Casanova's. I'll tell you a story about Noah's first girlfriend. You guys want to hear about Noah's first girlfriend? Yes. I should have put a picture. Is there any way to access Facebook up there where you guys could throw my Facebook page up there and they could see pictures of my kid that's not here? No? It's all right. Maybe we'll work on that for tomorrow. Uh, but anyway, he doesn't look exactly like me. But um, anyway, if you could probably look if you had the book. I think he's on the back of that book, is he? Yeah, those are the only two I have. Anyway, um, his first girlfriend, so here he is. He went into, let's see, was it last year or this year? It's seventh grade, right? Yeah, seventh grade. He uh, comes home, and I was like, how was your day? And he goes, I got, I got a girlfriend. And I was like, first thing I said was, don't tell your mom. <laughs> uh, you know, because the dad is like, way to go, man. You're awesome. You're such a stud. You know, that's how God, you know, that's how dads kind of look at it when they're son. Now, if it's your daughter, I don't have any daughters, but I can imagine that if it's like your daughter gets a boyfriend, it's totally different. Like, go get my gun kind of thing. And it's totally different. I think I would be that way too, or, you know, sharpen my machete. We're going after this cat. And, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, but when he came, he, he says, Dad, I got a girlfriend. And I was like, really? And I couldn't even pronounce her name. I mean, I don't know. I, I think she was of Asian descent or something like that. What is it? Nimtony was her name. And I, I said all kinds of stuff. I was making fun of him, and it probably was wrong of me or whatever. I wasn't trying to make light of the girl. But I was like, what do you know about this girl? And he's like, I know her name is Nimtony. And, and I was like... What grade is she in? Oh, she's in my grade. What's her last name? I don't know. And I said, do you know anything about this girl? I said, does she go to church? I don't know. And I was like, these are important questions that you need to ask yourself before you find a girlfriend or a boyfriend. This, is, this can go for any of you, all right? And we're going to talk about relationships tonight, which will be really fun. So this is a good segue into it. But, uh, <laughs> and not, not just boyfriend and girlfriend relationships. It's going to be all relationships, okay? But anyway, he's, he doesn't have any answers for me except, you know, talking to a guy sometimes, a teenage boy is like talking to that wall over there. And in fact, you may get more conversation from the wall than you get from a teenage boy sometimes. You know, I know that's not the case with all teenage boys, but the general stereotype is they're not going to just offer you information. So we were actually doing pretty well that he offered the information that he had a girlfriend. So I said, you need to go back and tomorrow and find out something about this girl especially before your mom finds out about her, 
all right? Because she's going to have more questions about this girl than I do, okay? And he's like, okay, dad. And so he went to school, and, you know, the next day we went and picked him up from school, and he gets in the car, and I was like, anything happened today? I didn't even ask him about the girl, and, you know, I was going to let him give me the information. And uh, I was like, what happened today? And he goes, I don't have a girlfriend anymore. And, and I was like, what happened? I was kind of laughing at him. And uh, he's like, it's not funny, Dad. She won't even talk to me. And I was like, well, why not? Well, I broke up with her. And I said, she's never going to talk to you again. I said, one day. You didn't even make 24 hours, and you've broken up with her. I said, why? And she, he's like, well, I started asking her questions. And turned out she was, like, Buddhist and different things like that. Just, I, I don't know. It, it, you know, I'm not going to knock anybody's religion or anything, but it just wasn't the same ideals and the same beliefs that, that we have. And, he, you know, she was going in a different direction with her life. And he, you know, he made the right decision. I was proud of him. So that was his first girlfriend. And so far, his only girlfriend that I'm aware of. He's probably never going to tell me again that he had a girlfriend. So uh, he says right now he doesn't have time for that. He's focusing on playing basketball and stuff. So keeping his grades up. He wants to get a scholarship to play Division One basketball. So he's, he's pretty focused and determined to do that. And the fact that he's six foot three and just turned 14 is a pretty good thing. And so uh, uh, anyway, so that's Noah and his first girlfriend. Hopefully you uh, enjoyed that look into my crazy life. Uh, but back to these books here. Um, this one is about joy. It's the same setup as the love book, but it's about joy. Everybody could use some more joy in their life. You gave it to a girl, so I'm going to go to a boy with... And all the girls are, like, sad, putting their hands down. You want joy? You look pretty happy to me, though. Uh, you right here, American, what, like American Ninja Warrior. All right, come here, American. You can have joy. And then this last one is peace. There's probably some adults out there that want this one right here. So once you start to get to a certain age, this is what starts to go right there. Uh, you start getting, it gets more and more difficult to have peace. But let's see here. Man, this is just so hard. I'm going to have to bring even more books tomorrow. This, this section to peace. I tell you what, the adults that are in here, any book of mine that you want, I'll give it to you. So you guys can put your hands down. The adults, put your hands down. I'll hook you up with a book before we leave tomorrow. I'll bring you all one. And then, let's see, we'll go with the kids. All right. Here you go. What? It's, it's not personal. It's not personal. I just like her better than you. Just get, I'm just kidding. We just made it personal, right? I'm just messing with you. You're going to really enjoy today's message then. Maybe tomorrow. I'm going to talk about forgiveness tomorrow. So you, may, you guys may not want to show up tomorrow afternoon. But uh, praise God. Um, I want to talk to you about relationships tonight. Uh, I'm going to title the message. And given how awful my title was last night. Anybody remember that title from last night? See, you remember it. I knew if it was cheesy and bad enough, you would remember it. And you know what? I got a call from my wife. She watched the live stream. Heidi called me last night. As soon as we got out of service, she called me and she said, where did you come up with that title? She's like, that is the worst, corniest, cheesiest title I've ever heard in my life. And I said, I bet they remember it. And I was right. So it works out for me. Uh, but the title of tonight's message is, Why Can't We Be Friends? You guys heard that song before? Why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? And am I doing it justice? Why can't we be friends? Why can't we? All right, you got you to find that on iTunes tonight and make sure you download it. I don't know what the rest of the song says. That may just be it. You can YouTube it. I don't YouTube very much. But uh, how many of you enjoyed the service last night? What about Monday night? But... Last night was kind of unique, right? Especially there toward the end. Uh, I wanted to talk about that just for a second because I think we can carry what was said last night over into tonight as well. Go ahead and put your hands down, man. You all right? Airing out your armpits? Hope you got some deodorant in there. But um, 
Last night, I know a lot of you came up. I had several students come up to me, or youth come up and ask me, uh, and even had some adults come and say that you went back and you talked uh, with your groups and about the service last night and asked some different questions about, man, was it accurate and did it really resonate with you and hit home? And I, everything I heard was it was right on, okay? And there was questions like, how did you know? And to be honest, I don't remember anything I said to any of you last night, mostly because, maybe a few of you, but mostly because um, there's just a bunch of you. <laughs> and, you know, this morning when Justin was talking, I want to explain, you know, how something like that happens, all right? Because when you walk with the Holy Spirit, you can be in constant communication with him at all times. And, you know, he speaks to us far more than we listen. You understand? You know, the cool thing that, that Justin was sharing this morning was when he was in the car leaving the church and he felt the Holy Spirit nudging him to turn around and go back. You guys remember that story? And he was like, oh, you're crazy, okay? Uh, and he, he said, but I'm going to do it anyway. And so he turned around and he went back and then the Holy Spirit said to go into the grocery store, okay? And so he did that and he's still thinking it's crazy, all right? And some of you probably thought I was nuts last night. And I'll be honest with you, I thought I was nuts too. Okay, and, and then the Holy Spirit said, go get in line. And, you know, I thought it was funny because he got into the line and he didn't have anything to purchase. <laughs> and so, you know, you're really crazy when you're going to do something like that. And so he gets into the line and then the guy walks up to him and they begin to, to talk. Right. And I believe that God orchestrates those kinds of things. And if we're not listening to the Holy Spirit, then we miss out on opportunities like that. And I believe the same thing happened last night, just in a different way. Rather than him telling me where to go, he was telling me what to say. Okay, does that make sense? You can be in relationship with the Holy Spirit in such a way that he will speak to you, you know. And when he speaks to you, he's really, you know, the Bible says that he is testifying on behalf of Jesus. That the Holy Spirit is Jesus' mouthpiece to you. You know, I know we talk about how Jesus in our, is in our heart when we receive Christ, but really it's the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us and dwells within us. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms is what the Bible says. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's on the inside of us. That's why Jesus said before he, he, was, he left and before he was crucified and went uh, to heaven, that's why he said, it's, it's good for me to go. In fact, he said, it's it's better that I go so that I can send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, so that he, and he is going to make his home in your heart, all right? You've heard it said that we are temples of the Holy Spirit, right? And that means that if we listen close enough, he'll talk to us. And he'll give us direction, and he'll give us words to say. You know, in situations like Justin was talking about this morning, he'll lead us and tell us where he wants us to go, but then he doesn't just hang us out to dry. He'll also speak to us what he wants us to say, right? And that's what happened last night. And I'll be honest with you, it, it, that was not what I was expecting to do. I really sensed that he wanted me to just kind of look at each one of you in the eyes like I am right now and say something general about the entire group, okay, and encourage the entire group. But when I got into it and began to make eye contact with you and talk to you, he began to say certain things to certain people, and that's how it happened. Nobody called me and told me who you guys were <laughs> or uh, what you're going through or what your personality is or anything like that. And to be honest, I hadn't spent enough time with you to even begin to pick up on all that myself. And so uh, that's what happened. If we will stay in contact with the Holy Spirit, he will lead us. He will guide us. He'll help us in our decision making, right? He'll, he'll give us the answer to certain questions that we have. And if we don't believe that, then, you know, what are we really doing? We're playing a guessing game and trying to follow after God's will for our lives, right? There has to be something more. There has to be. And it's the Holy Spirit. He lives on the inside of you. And he lives on the inside of me. That's what's so cool. You know, Jesus, when he was a man walking this earth, you guys believe he was a man walking the earth, right? When he was a man walking the earth, he could only be in one place at a time, right? So if we wanted to have a meeting with Jesus back then, and we all wanted to hear what he had to say, right, then we would have to all cram into one space where Jesus was at. 
You know, and that's why when he was sitting and he was teaching the crowd at, at a house and, you know, there were people even outside trying to get in and, and those four guys with their paralyzed friend on a mat went up on top of the roof of the house Jesus was in. They dug a hole in the top, right, and they lowered their, their paralyzed friend down to the feet of Jesus. There were so many people there and there were, you know, the only way to see Jesus and to hear him was to be right there in his presence, and, you know, I believe that that's why it was a good thing that he, one of, the, one of the main reasons why it was a good thing that he died that death and he was raised to life and now is seated with, with the Father in the heavenly realms. The reason it was such a good thing is because he left the Holy Spirit who can live inside of us and now he can speak to each one of us no matter where we are, right? No matter what we're going through, no matter what continent we're on. Whether we're in an airplane, in a car, sitting in a sanctuary, we can hear the voice of God on the inside of us, right? That's what's so cool about what we believe, all right? That's what's so cool about having a relationship with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus Christ is he helps us. He's our helper. The Bible says he's an ever-present help in time of need, right? And so that's what happened last night, and the Holy Spirit was speaking to you. And for some of you, he was confirming things in you. For some of you, he was encouraging you, right? For some of you, he was restoring hope, and he was uh, giving some advice, and whatever was going on, that was just like, you know, his way of saying, you know, I'm, you're my child, and I want you to hear what I have to say to you tonight. This is for you as an individual. And he will help us in every area of life, including our relationships. And uh, that's what I want to talk about this evening, you know, because sometimes we don't know who we should allow to be close to us. Sometimes we don't know who we should hang out with. When you start making decisions as to whether you need to date or not and go out with this person or if this person asks you out, should I say yes or, or whatever the case may be, you know, you're going to, and then you're going to have people that just want to be your friend, okay? You'll have an inner circle of friends like Jesus had, and you need to know who you should allow to be close to you. It's very important for us to be serious when it comes to choosing our friends. Are you guys with me on this? I want to pray for you, and then we're going to go right into this. It's going to be very practical, but I believe that it's going to help you. I wish that when I was a young person, I would have had somebody share this kind of a message with me. Uh, because being a teenager is one of the most difficult times of life. And we've talked about it uh, a little bit on Monday night and Tuesday night, but you have so many different things and so many different people pulling at you and trying to sway you and trying to uh, get you to do this and try to tell you that you are like this and this is who you're going to be and, and this is what you need to look like. And, you know, you have so many different things and so many different people that are tugging on you that it can be a very, very difficult time and a very stressful time and a very tiring time of your life. And so I want to help you out. Is that okay? No? You're like, I don't want you to help me with my friends. It's all right. I'm going to help you anyway. All right. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you for every person in this place under the sound of my voice. Once again, I know that it's not by accident that we are here, but it is by divine design. And so, Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we just submit ourselves to you right now. We open up our hearts to receive from your word. We open up our eyes to see and our ears to hear whatever it is that you desire to show us, whatever it is that you desire to tell us. We say, let your will be done in this place tonight. Lord, let your anointing be on my life. Lord, that the things that I say would not be my own, but they would come directly from you. Jesus, may I be your mouthpiece tonight. May I say your words, and may I say them in a way that you would say them, Lord. And I give you all the glory tonight, give you all the honor for what you are about to do in this place, in your precious name. And everybody said, amen. I'll say this to you. Monday night, I said that you matter. You remember that? You matter, and you matter so much that your friends matter. Your friends matter. And listen to me carefully. Who you choose to surround yourself with can either make you or break you. And, you know, you can apply this as you get older, too, but 
I'm going to try and help you uh, not make some of the mistakes that I've made. And maybe there's some adults in here, too, that can testify, you know, I wasn't the, the wisest in my decision-making when it came to my friends. And maybe you can learn from some of the things that we've been through uh, and not have to repeat the same mistakes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, and I quoted it last night, uh, but I didn't stay in it very long. It says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Do not be misled. Do not be misled. Now, when I was looking over this and studying it in detail this afternoon, for whatever reason, this really stuck out to me, these first four words. Do not be misled. And what that said to me was, don't get off track. Don't get off track. God has a plan. God has a purpose for your life. He has a perfect will for you. He's got some things that he has called you to do. You know, we said that you are God's masterpiece. He created you anew in Christ. The last part of that verse is so that you can do the good things that he planned for you in advance to do. So he's got something good in store for you. He has a great plan. It's a plan to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and to give you a future. You know, God has already written your biography, all right? And now what we do is we live our lives by faith, trying to live out what he's already written concerning our lives, okay? So by faith, we're trying to follow that path and stay on track, but here, Paul is very clear. He says to us, do not be misled. And what that said to me as I was thinking about this today is that there are going to be certain people that come into your life for the sole purpose of trying to get you off track. That will try to get you to do things that go against what God has called you to do. That will try and influence you to do things that you know are not right, that are maybe even sinful, but really... These people will come into your life and they may not come on purpose, okay? Maybe they're well-intentioned individuals and they'll tell you what they think and they'll tell you how they would do stuff. But just because somebody tells you what you think doesn't mean that it's what God thinks, okay? And so there will be people that come into your life that pull on you, that push you to do certain things, that tell you things that are contrary to what God has called you to do, and they are there for the intent to mislead you, to try and get you off track. The enemy of your soul knows that the plan that God has for you is so great that he will use people to try and get you off track and to do what you know is not right. And so that's why, one of the reasons why it's so important for you to know who you are in Christ. What well, I talked about last night. It's so important for you to know how valuable you are and how valuable you are to the kingdom of God. It's so important for you to understand. And it's so important for me to understand how valuable our lives really are. Because there are some people that are going to try and get you off track and get you to do something that is contrary to the will of God. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Have you ever had bad company at your house before? I got to tell you a story. Lord have mercy. Our house, we, we keep things really clean at our house for the most part. My wife is very particular about things. She's not like over the top nuts or anything, okay? I don't want to paint a bad picture like she's OCD. Like, dear Lord, there's, who threw these on the floor? Okay. She's not going to be like that. But we, we like to keep things picked up. We like our stuff to be where it's supposed to be. We vacuum every week and we do this and that. We'll clean the house every couple of weeks or whatever we need to do to keep things nice and tidy. And we like our pictures to hang straight on the wall and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, if one gets crooked, we're not going to be like, who did this? We're just going to kind of slide it back into place and keep going on with our lives. There's just something about neatness and order. She's, we, we like an organized house, Okay. And we understand that when people come over, they don't have those same ideals. <laughs> and I remember, you know, I'm not the most handy person in the world when it comes to doing things around the house. I have, I don't mind trying stuff, but I usually end up breaking stuff, all right? And uh, 
you know, I'm not going to go in and I, cause I know how much things cost to fix if you break them. And so I don't go in and do like major projects or renovation projects in our house. You know, there's some things that we'd like to do to upgrade our bathrooms and stuff like that. And so I called a guy from our church who does that kind of work. And he was like, yeah, I'll come and I'll check out what you've got. And you can tell me what you think. And I'll give you an estimate and all this. And, and I was like, okay, cool. You can come over after school. And, you know, this is what time we normally get home. And so here he comes, probably about 6 o'clock in the evening. And he brought his son with him. And I was thinking, oh, that's harmless, right? And uh, his little boy, he's like three. I'm thinking, okay, these guys go to our church. His, his kid's going to be cool. And, you know, he's, he's actually been out of the house and other people's houses before. And, you know, he's gonna, it's going to be fine. And so we're walking through the house. I said, just let him, just, I don't remember the boy's name. I said, just let him go in there. Noah and Jack were in Jack's room playing video games. And I was like, put a movie on for him or whatever. Just go, go into the room. And so we're showing him around and kind of telling him what we'd like to do in our bathrooms. And I start hearing banging, and I start hearing crashing, and I start hearing all this different stuff going on. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I, you know, we, we go over, and I kind of open the door to Jack's room, and I look in, and this, this kid is jumping on the bed. He's hitting his head on the ceiling and smacking stuff, and he's doing cannonballs off onto the, I'm just like, what is happening? And he's going nuts. And so I just backed back out and shut the door. And I was like, I am not going back in there. And so we kept kind of talking and going on. And, and, and he finally says, okay, son, it's time to go. And here, here he comes out. And you can just see it in his eye. You ever seen it in a kid's eyes when they're just going to destroy everything that they see? And they're just, bah! okay. And he comes out and you just see it in his eyes. And he hops over the back of our couch. And he starts running across the couch. And I'm just going, oh, my. And, and the guy, you know, he, he just kept talking and talking to us. And I'm sitting there going, Yes, very good. Yeah, yeah. You're going you're gonna to write that up for us and send it to us in an email? Okay, yeah. And, you know, I'm just like trying to get him to go so he can get this kid out of here. All right? And so the kid's running around, and he's just, he's cutting flips, and he's diving, and the rug is going everywhere, and I'm just going, oh, my Lord. Have, you guys understand what I'm saying? He's, he's wrecking my ambiance, man. You know? Wrecking my ambiance. And I'm just like, what's happening? And so they, they left, and... I went into Jack's room to assess the damage. And I go in there, and it had been all tidy, you know, and everything was where it was supposed to be. You know, we have these, have this bar installed. That I was actually able to do that. I was able to screw the bar into the wall. And then there's these things hooked on there, these little buckets, and they're labeled, and Jack has, like, stuff that goes in one bucket and another bucket. It's labeled, but it doesn't matter because it's Jack. And... <laughs> And so he's got like Xbox controller and pencils and whatever and this and that. All that's on the floor. It's on the floor. And then we had like these things hung on the, on the wall and they're laying on the bed. Big, you know, from Hobby Lobby, just completely thrown off the walls. And I was just like, what is, has happened? How could something so small create so much destruction? <laughs> and I was like... Man, I just was left shell-shocked by this. So we started, you know, I went and got the, the level and nails and whatever else and started putting the house back together. And, and, uh, and I got to thinking how quickly, you know, and you got to understand how my mind works. Almost everything is a sermon illustration that happens to me. And I got to thinking how quickly the wrong person can come into our lives could be a well-meaning person. The kid wasn't, I mean, he was three. He wasn't meaning to destroy the house. He was just being three, right? And it's, it's amazing to me how quickly somebody can come in if the wrong person is allowed in and we have no way of determining who those people are, right? They just come in and they can wreak all kinds of havoc in our lives and cause such a disturbance in our lives and in our hearts before we even have a chance to realize what's happened. Before we even have a chance. And so it's so important for us because friends can either make us or break us. It's so important for us to have a way of determining who our friends are. Who are we going to date? 
Who are we going to allow to be close to us? Because if we let the wrong person close to us, they can completely destroy everything if we're not careful. And I'm not trying to scare you off, and I'm not telling you to avoid all people. We are called to love all people. But there are some people that we cannot afford to have close to us. And if we don't have a way of determining who those people are, they will lead us astray. They will lead us astray, and they will do so very quickly. Proverbs 12, 26, I quoted this last night, and I couldn't remember if it was 26, 12 or 12, 26. It was 12, 26. The righteous choose their friends carefully. Everybody say that with me, carefully. How do the righteous choose their friends? Carefully. Who are the righteous? You are. We talked about that last night. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? You're a new creation in Christ. You are righteous. So the righteous choose their friends carefully. Now, I want you to ask yourself, you don't have to raise your hand or anything like that or even say it out loud, but do you, or you can say, do I choose my friends carefully? Do you choose your friends carefully? Who do you allow to be close to you? The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. There it is. The way of the wicked leads them astray. Astray. That's when you get misled. Do not be misled. We will be misled if we allow the wrong people into our inner circle of friends. We'll be led astray very quickly. And I may have said this to a couple of you last night, but I'll say it to all of you. Be the kind of friend you want to have. If you want to attract the right people to your life, then be an attractive person. And it has nothing to do with the way that you look, all right? We're not talking about that kind of being attractive. I'm talking about the qualities of your life, and I'm talking about the things that are important to you, your ideals, your beliefs. You know, what is important to you? Are you kind? If you want to be surrounded by kind people, be kind. If you want to surround yourself with people that are rude and crude and mean and bad, you know what? Then be rude and crude and mean and bad. Because the kind people aren't going to come find you to be your friend. Right? Kindness attracts kindness. Gentleness account, uh, attracts gentleness. If you want to have friends that love you and that are there for you, then be a friend that loves and is there for other people. So that's just a really practical word of advice that I would give you. Be the kind of person, be the kind of friend that you want to have close to you. Are you guys with me on this? I'm going to give you some things that are going to really help you. It's not inappropriate to require something of those you are in relationship with. It's not inappropriate. Setting godly standards, that's something that you need to do. I would encourage you to set godly standards for your relationships. And it starts with, it may start with your best friend. It may start with uh, your two or three best friends. And certainly when you begin to date, if you've already begun to date, you need to do this if you haven't already. Make a list of godly standards that you are going to stick by and that you are going to require of those that you are in relationship with. And I know that none of you want to hear this, except for the parents and the grandparent type people in here and the leaders in here. Yeah, I can see you guys shaking your head. Yes, please do this. But I want the young people to hear me. Do this. It will save you so much disappointment and so much heartache if you will just take the time to write down and set some godly standards for your relationships. And then to stick by them. If somebody doesn't meet that godly standard or that expectation, then you cannot afford to have that person close to you. That's what it means. The righteous choose their friends carefully, not foolishly. And I believe the most foolish thing that we can do is just invite anybody and everybody to be close to us. You can have access to my life. Come on in. Doors always open. When it comes to certain people, you can't afford to have the door open because they'll come in and stop, start knocking all the pictures off the wall. <laughs> Do you guys hear what I'm saying? The righteous choose 
their friends carefully. It's not inappropriate. I would have the conversation, especially as you're going into a dating relationship. If a boy asks you out, girl, I would say this to you. Sit down and say, all right, if you can do each of these things or not do these things, sure. And mom and dad say it's okay. Then you can go out. And then if it starts to turn at some point in the relationship, because I'll tell you this, a guy will tell you what you want to hear. And guys, you're not immune to this either. A girl will tell you what you want to hear in order to get that date. But if something changes when you go out and you've been in that relationship for a little bit, maybe they fooled you at the beginning. But if something shifts and begins to turn, you need to say, hold up. I got some standards here. I don't know what they still say. Talk to the hand. You better take my name out of your contacts or whatever. Unsnapchat me. I don't even know. What, is that, does that even a thing? Unsnapchat? It is a thing? I know you can unfriend people. The only thing I've got is... Facebook. That's like the old person's social media now. <laughs> Everybody else is in Snapchat and Instagram and stuff like that. And I don't, I don't Snapchat. I think, I think you guys like Snapchat because it disappears. Is that right? It disappears after a certain amount of time. Yeah. Like you're disappearing. Where are you going? Oh my Lord. You could never be a teacher. I'll tell you that much. I, I didn't realize how long I could hold it until I became a teacher. Because you can't leave the classroom. They'll go nuts. I, the longest I ever went was like 10 hours. He didn't even make one. <laughs> but you can't afford to become lazy on these standards. But you, you're not even going to have to make that decision if you don't make the standard. You need to set godly standards and then expect people to meet them. We love all people, but not everyone loves you. We love all people, but not everyone cares about your future. We love all people, but there are some that we just can't allow to be too close. There are some people that I was friends with in high school that I'm no longer friends with. And, and it ended amicably, all right? It's not like we hate each other or anything like that. We just aren't in contact anymore because our lives are going in different directions. And there are certain people that will get us off track if we allow them to. Set godly standards and then expect people to meet them. That's okay. It's okay. You know, before Heidi and I got married, we sat down and we talked about what we wanted for the future, where our expectation was. She said she wanted to go to Africa. I said no. I said, and I've been to Africa. I said I'll never live in Arkansas. They've lost their teeth and stuff there. I don't want to lose my teeth. I want to keep mine. That's a bad stereotype. I have a lot of great friends in Arkansas. I said, I don't ever want to live in Arkansas. Our first ministry position after we got married was in Arkansas. But sit down and have that conversation. We sat down and we talked about the future, how many kids we want to have, what we were going to do for the rest of our lives, what was important to us. We knew all those things before we entered into the biggest decision of our lives. Sit down, have those conversations. And it may be weird, it may be awkward, and if the person can't commit to it, then they're not worth your time, especially in a dating relationship. This is just so much fun. <laughs> Four tips that I'm going to give you. They're all scriptural and they're all going to help you out. All right. If you don't write anything else down tonight, that's cool. But write these things down, type it into your phone, whatever you need to do. And I'll give you a scripture reference for each of them. But I'm going to give you four tips to help you choose your friends. We're going to call this true friends here. True friends. Number one. True friends forgive and move forward. True friends forgive and move forward. In Proverbs 17, 9, it says, You will keep your friends if you forgive them, but you will lose your friends if you keep talking about what they did wrong. <laughs> 
true friends, forgive, and move forward. There are some other things going on here as well. You don't want to have a person in your life that constantly betrays you. You hear what I'm saying? You don't want to have a friend that is constantly gossiping about you or spreading some kind of juicy rumor about you or saying some kind of lie about you or trying to always be better than you and trying to make you look bad. You don't want somebody in your life close to you. You're gonna, you have enough enemies doing that, okay? You don't need to allow somebody close to you that has your ear that's in your heart talking down to you, trying to bring you down, that sins against you constantly. Uh, you, you need to forgive them and move on, absolutely. But you also need people in your life that will forgive you and move on. All right? There's a couple different things that we're tackling right here. You don't need to have people that are just constantly offending you, close to you, okay? But also, you need to have people in your life that will forgive you and move on when you make mistakes. Now, that doesn't give you a license to be a bad friend, but you don't want to have friends that are always holding something over your head or always holding a grudge against you or always looking at you the wrong way and talking about you the wrong way. You need to have friends in your life that forgive and move forward, and you also need to be a friend that forgives and move fo moves forward. Do you hear what I'm saying? And when somebody wrongs you, don't just keep talking about it. Because if you keep talking about it, it will never die. Remember we said, Proverbs 18, 21, that the power of life and death is in your tongue. So if you keep talking about something that was done wrong to you, all right, or if somebody keeps talking about something that you did wrong, it's never going to die. It's just going to continue to live and continue to fester and continue to cause problems and continue to put a wedge in the relationship. You need to have friends, true friends, will forgive and move on and move forward. True friends. The second thing, and this is going to go by pretty quick, and this is big. True friends are in it for the long haul. So true friends forgive and move forward. And number two, true friends are in it for the long haul. Here's a good question to ask yourself. When the going gets tough, do my friends get going? <laughs> when the going gets tough, do my friends disappear? They don't want any part of my need. They're gone when the going gets tough. True friends are in it for the long haul. You want somebody that's going to stick by you through thick and thin, your best days and your worst days. You know, I have a tremendous friend. Uh, I mean, obviously my wife is my best friend, but my best friend growing up was a kid by the name of Nate, Nathan. And his last name was Fink, and I still give him a hard time about that. But Nate was my boy, and we, went, we grew up together basically from our teenage years. I think I was 12 when I met him. I'm 38 now, and we are still good friends. We haven't lived by each other for over 20 years, but we are still good friends. He's one of those that I can call up. I, I remember one time, you know, we were always there for each other. I remember one time we went to play basketball at the park, and we were playing two-on-two -two basketball. It was me and him versus these other two guys. And one of the guys was really big. He's like, could like pick us up and slam us kind of person. Because I was tall, but I was scrawny, kind of like now, okay? And so we were playing basketball, and, and I, we were both pretty good, and the other team was pretty good, and we were going at each other, and we're playing. And my friend Nate, he just had this thing about fouling relentlessly. He fouled. And he thought just because we were playing street ball that you were, you know, everyone was cool with you just fouling the mess out of them. And so he would do this thing. Get up here, Jack. He put his arm like this. Pretend you're dribbling the ball. He's like dribbling, okay? You're so good at this. And my friend Nate would come up, put one arm behind the kid with the ball, and then swing his other arm like this. And, I mean, heart, thank you. That was very good. Wonderful, wonderfully done. And he would just foul the mess out of him. Well, the kid kept saying, stop, stop, stop. 
And, and so my, my friend kept fouling the mess out of him. And finally, this guy got enough of it, and he picked Nate up by the collar of his shirt and lifted him up off the ground like this. And I was like, <laughs> and he's like, Nate's like looking at me, Mike, 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 help me. What are you doing? And I'm like, do you see this kid? He's like, yes, I see him. He's picking me up. And the kid started, my, my friend wore glasses, and, and the kid, I don't know, he had something against hitting people with glasses on. And he's like, take off your glasses. And, and Nate's like, no. And he, he's going, take off your glasses. And Nate's looking at me like, what do I do? What do I do? Help me, Mike. And I said, don't take off your glasses. And I was there for him. I had great advice for him. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mess with the kid, man. He would have killed both of us. I said, don't take off your glasses. <laughs> Looking back, it probably wasn't a very good friend at that moment, but it makes for a good story. I did give him some good advice. He didn't end up getting his brains beat in. It was kind of funny, but he's one of those friends. He didn't get his brains beat in. He didn't, sorry. I kind of put it, slurred it together there, but no, he, he ended up being all right. No punches were thrown. In fact, I think there was a car that drove up at that moment and a guy got out of the back with a gun, but that's a different story. <laughs> it happened. I grew up in Dallas, so lots of crazy things happened. So we ran. Everybody dropped everything, including the people they were holding, and we ran. So anyway, <laughs> coming back, you need to have friends that are in it for the long haul. To make a long story short, he was the best man in my wedding. I was the best man in his wedding. And we can go without seeing each other for years. And then a phone call, and we pick up right where we left off. He's been in it for the long haul. If I need anything, if I need prayer for something, or I need advice, I can call him, and he's there for me. Same thing for him. If he, he needs me, he can call me, and I'll help him. Whatever, whatever I can do in any way. You need people that are in it for the long haul. And some of you already know who those friends are in your life. You have some already that have been there for you for a while. And you need as many of those people as you can find that will be there during the best times. They'll celebrate with you during the best times. And they'll be there to comfort you and encourage you and help you through the difficult times. You need people. True friends are in it for the long haul. I told you I was going to give you scripture references. In Proverbs 17, uh, 17 same, same chapter uh, as the previous one, it says a friend loves at all times. Everyone say all times. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity, or a sister, or a good friend is born for adversity. That means that when times get tough, there are certain people that God will bring into your life. Maybe he's already placed them there that aren't going to tuck tail and run when things get difficult. They're going to stick by you through thick and thin. Those are the people that are born for adversity not from adversity. They're born for that adversity in your life, and they will be there for you to the very end. You need to pray and ask God to send those kind of people into your life. And I'm sitting here and standing here tonight telling you that it is important to have those people because you will walk through some difficult things in this life, and you're going to need all the help that you can get. You don't need someone to abandon you when things get tough. You need somebody that's going to stick by you. And that goes for a friendship, and that goes for any relationship that you may get into, whether you're dating or whether you're married or whatever. All right. Third thing. What's the first one? They forgive each other. Yeah, they forgive and move on. All right. Second thing, they're in it for the long haul. Isn't that a diary of a wimpy kid book, long haul? All right, there you go. Trying to give you something to connect with. <laughs> Third thing, true friends are givers. This is so important. True friends are givers. Every relationship needs a healthy balance of giving and receiving. However, some people who come into your life do so for the sole reason to get something from you. They're called takers. 
and they will take, 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 take. They'll take your time. They'll take your energy. And when you have money, they'll take your money too. They'll take, 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 take. And won't invest or give anything back into you. It's kind of like uh, those fish that you would buy for the aquarium. Where they, I don't even know what the proper word is for them, but we just called them sucker fish. You guys know the sucker fish? It's the one that'll get on the side of the aquarium and just eat all the algae off there and just, you know, just move along like this at a glacial pace, sucking the algae off the... You know, just keep going, and then by the time it finishes one wall, you know, it's moved so slow it can start back. It's just sucking it off, all right? And that's what takers do. They'll come, and they will just continue to take, 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 take. Without investing anything into you. They'll leave you tired. They'll leave you broke. They'll leave you hurt. And when it seems like you don't have anything else to give... Then they'll leave you. They'll take from you. Some of them will take your test answers. <laughs> Just going to try and hit home here with you. Like, you might, you know, I'm going to sit behind you in class. And if you'll kind of lean this way, I'll be able to see your paper really well. Or maybe we can do some some this group activity, you can be in my group. You know, since you get A's and stuff. Or actually, these, some of them may be like, you get, you get C's? Can I sit with you? I'm gonna copy off you. It happens in, in a lot of different ways, guys. Takers, they're gonna take from you. And they'll try and get you to do things that you know are wrong and they'll it's all for their own personal benefit. A lot of selfish people in the world. And again, we are to love those people. We're to love them. You can share the gospel message with them, but you don't want those people close to you, especially as you get older and as you get more responsibility and as you get a job and as you get into relationships and you have a family and all this different stuff begins to happen. You can't afford to surround yourself with people that are there just to get something from you. You need to have a, health, a healthy relationship has people giving and receiving. If you're in a relationship with somebody and you're giving and giving and giving and they're just taking and taking and taking and taking, who's benefiting from that? They are. Is it of any benefit to you? No. no. A lot of times we see this in teenage relationships. And it doesn't even have to be a teenage dating relationship. It can be an adult relationship. Where one person is just taking and taking and taking and monopolizing all the time and all the energy, taking and taking and taking, and that person just keeps giving and giving and giving. And I think that in givers, sometimes we have this idea, because I'm a giver, we have this idea sometimes when we are giving to people that our giving is going to change them from a taker into a giver. But a taker doesn't care anything about you. Only what you have to offer them. And so if somebody is in the relationship just to take something from you, it may be to take your virginity. Somebody just woke up. It may be to take something that is very precious to you, something that's very dear to your heart. And the enemy would like nothing more than to send a taker into your life to take something that's precious and to rob you of your innocence. And you cannot afford to have that person in your life. I hope that you're hearing the importance of this. I know it's not fancy. I know it's not maybe what you would typically hear or like to hear. But I believe it's one of the most important messages that you can hear. True friends. True friends forgive and move forward. True friends are in it for the long haul. True friends are givers. Surround yourself with givers. Be a giver. Be a giver if you want givers in your life. 
Invest yourself into your relationships. Be there for other people. Give the best parts of yourself to others. Be kind. Be loving. Be forgiving. Give mercy to others. And you'll attract those things. All right. Last one. True friends will hold you accountable. I saved the best one for last. True friends will hold you accountable. You know, the enemy will send certain people into your life to get you off track. But God sends certain people into your life to keep you on track or to get you back on track. Aren't you glad? Proverbs 27, 6, I really like this verse. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Let me say it again, and I'm going to explain it to you here real quick. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Another version says it like this. You can trust a friend who corrects you, but kisses from an enemy are nothing but lies. I like this first part. You can trust a friend who corrects you. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that when you speak incorrectly, your grammar is wrong, that they come up and go, uh, it's not sended you, it's sent you. That's not the kind of correcting I'm talking about here. I'm talking about if you get off track, all right, if you begin to do things that are wrong, you know, that go against the standards that you have set, the godly standards that you have set for yourself, if you begin to venture off of that path of what God has called you to do and what you know is right, you need to have somebody in your inner circle that doesn't matter what you think if they tell you the hard truths about yourself. You need to have a friend, maybe even multiple friends that are close to you, that they are willing to risk your friendship to tell you the truth. Do you hear what I'm saying? You need to be willing, and I'll say it again. You need to have a friend that is willing to risk the friendship just to tell you the hard truth about yourself. We need those people in our lives that we trust. You can trust the correction of a friend. It says that faithful are the wounds, all right? It said faithful. It's talking about wounds. Let me say it again. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. What, what is it talking about wounds? It's talking about when a friend, a true friend, comes to you and corrects you and gives you a hard truth. It may hurt you a little bit. It may make you mad for a little bit, but faithful are the wounds. Why? Because those wounds will eventually heal because they're coming from a place of love. Somebody that cares about you, somebody that wants you to do right, somebody that wants you to succeed. We all need to have somebody in our lives that will come up and tell us the hard truths about ourselves, and it may hurt, and it may not feel very good, and we may even deny it. I'll be the first one to tell you. My wife is that person for me. And I have a couple of others. And I know that when Heidi comes to me and she says, we need to talk. Because I've noticed something about you. It's not a reason for me to go get divorce papers. Or to start questioning the relationship. Or be like, what have I done? She's going to leave me. Or, I need to leave her. What's, what does she think? No. I need her to be able to come to me. I need to have her in that position in my life so that when my life gets out of line and I begin to talk a wrong way or if I have a negative feeling about something, I need to have that person. I need her to come and to tell me. And it's not easy to hear the truth about ourselves sometimes. And I'll be honest with you, it's very difficult at your age to find somebody and to find that kind of person that's your age. 
There aren't very many 13-year-olds that are going to tell another 13-year-old the truth <laughs> about themselves. So what am I saying? You need to surround yourself and you need to be open to the leaders that God puts into your life. You need to be open to the youth pastor. You need to be open to the youth leader. You need to be open to the pastor of the church. You need to be open to the teacher. You need to be open to your mom. You need to be open to your dad. You need to be open to the older sibling. You need to be open to that person. Whoever God brings into you, you need to be open to the Sunday school teacher. You need to be open to the school counselor. If they come and they have something that's on their heart for you and they need to bring correction into your life, you need to be strong enough to say, okay, it may hurt a little bit, but I know that this wound will heal because you love me. You need to have, and I need to have, people in our lives that hold us accountable. And if you have a young friend that can do that, if you have someone your age that can do that, whoo, hold on to them. Hang on to them. But if you don't have that, don't just go searching for it. Find it in an adult that you trust, in an adult that cares about you and your future, who loves you and has been there for you and has proven their love for you. Those people are all over this room right now. Those people brought you to this camp. Those people are at this camp. They're leading this camp. They're directing this camp. They're running cameras. They're, they're over the games. They're the worship leaders. God brings people into our lives to help keep us on track. And when we get off track, they help us get back on. You know, for me, it was my dad when I was young. When I was a teenager, it was my dad. I had and my youth pastor as well. The, we, I had great leaders that God put into my life that I was in relationship with. But I remember one time I had a friend, and he was a complete nut job. He was crazy. And I didn't realize he was crazy. I just thought he was funny. I was like, well, whatever. If he wants to go bang his head on the wall and put his fist through the door or whatever, great. I'm not going to do that, but he's just kind of funny. He's crazy. And my dad watched our relationship, and I was friends with him for several years. And I remember he called me into his office one day because he had started to observe some not just goofy behavior, but some really wrong behavior in my friend that I had overlooked. Because I loved him. He's awesome. He's my best friend. And my dad called me in, and he said, you need to cut ties with this guy. You're going to end up in trouble. And it was then that I made a decision. I'm not going to allow myself to continue to be close to this, this guy. It took me a couple days, I'm not going to lie. At first, I was mad at my dad, and I even probably yelled at him right then. He said, this guy does not need to be your best friend. You can see him at church or whatever, because we went to the same church. You know, he's some, some church kids are nuts, too. Going down the wrong path. Okay, it happens. He said, you can see him at church, you can go to youth group events or whatever, but you don't need to have him close to you anymore. And I was mad. I was like, Pfft. okay, dad, you just don't want me to have fun. You don't understand him. He's just, he's just funny. He's just, he's hilarious. You don't understand. I love, I love this guy. We, we, we have so much fun together. We play basketball. We do all this. We have so many things in common. I just, you don't understand, dad. And he goes, listen to me. You need to cut ties with this guy. And I was mad. And, he's, and my dad didn't care. He was like, whatever, I'm not your friend. I'm your dad. <laughs> you don't get to be friends with your kids until they're adults. Right, Jack? I have to remind you guys that I'm not your friend. I can be friendly, but I'm your dad. And he didn't care. He didn't care how bent out of shape I was. But I went and I thought about it because why? Because I valued my dad's input. I realized I needed that accountability. And so I made the decision to separate myself from him. And you know what? He got into drugs. He got into sleeping around. He got into all kinds of different things, almost went to prison. You know, 
Sometimes God sends people into our lives that see things that we don't see. You hear what I'm saying? He'll send people into our lives that see things that we don't see or understand. We need those people. We need to be okay with being held accountable. Guys, y'all can come up. I know this hasn't been a super fancy message. But I believe that it's one that will change the course of your life. True friends forgive and move forward. True friends are in it for the long haul. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Logan. True friends. What's the third one? I've asked you the first two. What's the third one? True friends are givers, right? And then the last one, true friends will hold you accountable. And again, if you want to attract these qualities in your friends, be this kind of a person. Be willing to forgive and move forward. Be willing to stay in it for the long haul. Be willing to give. Be willing. Be willing to hold others accountable. I'm going to ask you to stand. If you remember all the way back to where we started this, I said that the Holy Spirit is your helper. And I think one of the best things that you can do tonight as we close and as we pray, and I'm going to pray over you. But as we pray, what I would encourage you to do is in your prayer time, and you may want to come down to the front to do this, or you may want to do it from your chair or whatever. But if I was you, I would ask the Holy Spirit, show me. Give me the names of people that I may not need to have in my inner circle of friends is there a group that you're trying to belong to at school that you probably shouldn't be trying to belong to are there certain people that you're keeping at an arm's distance that the Holy Spirit wants you to allow to come in and be there for you more than anything moving forward because I think a lot of you have some good friends in here I think for the most part, those that are in here, we have a pretty good thing going on. But as you get older and as you move forward in life, I pray as new relationships come and as they go that you would take these four things with you. Set some godly standards, guys. When you start moving into dating relationships and doing those different things, set those standards and stick by them. And if people are unwilling, if that guy is unwilling to meet those standards and to stand by you and to support you in what you believe, then he is not worth your time. Guys, if that girl is not willing to stand by you and the standards that you have set and to support you in what you believe, she is not worth your time. You're just going to end up being led astray. And don't missionary date. You know what missionary dating is? You've probably heard about it before. Missionary dating, you're saved, and the person you're going to date is not. You're going to date them and try and get them saved. More times than not, that's not going to work. Be a friend, be an acquaintance, you know, share the gospel with them, but... I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to pray over you. And I want you just to be honest with yourself as I pray. And then we'll go into the last song. And you can worship from worship or pray from your chair. Or you can come down to the front. And, but I believe as I pray that the Holy Spirit is going to begin to talk to you about your relationships. In much the same way that he spoke to each of you last night, he, can, he spoke through me to you last night. He can speak the same way in your heart directly to you you just have to be open to hearing his voice 
So as I begin to pray, I want you just to give the Holy Spirit access to you. Open up your heart. Let him speak to you. Lord, I thank you for every single person in this place under the sound of my voice, every young person, every young adult, every adult counselor, youth pastor, leader that's in this place. Lord, we just open up our hearts to you right now. I pray that you would begin to speak to us. Lord, that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, that you would begin to show us. Lord, reveal to us who we should be in relationship with. Lord, give us discernment. Lord, that we wouldn't go blindly into our relationships. I pray that you would give us the discipline. Help us to discipline ourselves, Lord, to set standards and then to stick by them. Lord, that we wouldn't just allow anybody to come too close. Lord, I pray that we would take the things that these these four truths, God, that we've heard tonight, I pray that we would take them and that we would apply them to our lives and we would apply them to every relationship. Lord, that those that we allow to be close to us would be the ones that you would have be close to us. Lord, we want to be in relationship with those that love us, that forgive and move forward. We want to be in relationship with those that are in it for the long haul. We want to be in in relationships with those that are givers and that hold us accountable. God, bring those people into our lives. If we don't have them already, God, I pray that you would set up appointments, God, that we would have those people. Each one of us would have those kinds of people in our lives. Lord, for those that are here and that they don't have somebody that holds them accountable and that tells them the hard truths, God, I pray that you would bring that person into their lives. Lord, we need that accountability, those people that will help us stay on track and then to get back on track when we're off. Lord, we just surrender ourselves to you tonight. I thank you for your word. I thank you for every single young person in this place. Lord, may we take this word and hold on to it. In Jesus' name, amen.
right, guys. Um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss to our church groups, same locations that it's been all week. Um, my challenge is to share what God's been doing in your life this week. I know that he's been moving. Um, let's use this time to come together as a church and to share you know, what God is doing in our lives. Y'all are dismissed.